So I'll start and, and yeah. Hey Doug, and that's Tom with you, right? Yes. All right. Hey. Hey, hey Tom. Where so let me start. Back? Let me start and just give everybody a little bit of a um, bit of information. I've been sending out all kinds of info, whether it's text, email, phone call, trying to make sure everybody's got their ducks in the row. They've got their plate clean or full, ready to go. Not every, oh, that's Chantel. Hi, Chantel. Um, making sure everybody is primed and ready to go because sooner, maybe sooner than later, there's gonna be some action. And if you're not ready, if you don't understand this, you're not gonna be a good soldier. You'll probably get out there, but there may be some things that you don't understand or you try and turn receipts in or whatever it is. So having said that, um, and I think all you guys are probably good to go. I can check on that. But my point is there's always things that you don't know. Um, Doug has been on these occurrences. Um, Eric Fox has been on these occurrences. Um, let's see, Roy also, Tim, I don't know if Tim's on here twice, but Tim has been. Uh, Rod, is that, uh, that's Todd, I believe. And yes, so most everybody that's in this meeting has at least seen a little bit of this. I think Chantel would be, and Octavius might be the two that have not seen what this is all about. And, but you guys, I think, are pretty much up to speed. That's important. Why is it so important? Well, you figure it out soon enough that there's, um, there are some things that if you don't do properly, they don't reimburse you for your receipt. And that sucks, especially if it's a gas receipt, because how much are gas receipts today? They used to be $25, $30. Now they're $50, $80, $100. So you want to make sure that you understand all that stuff before you get out there. Remember, you get paid to get there. In other words, your hours are paid. Your fuel is paid, but only if you do the right thing via the receipt, which means you get a receipt that has gallons, price per gallon, and total. You can't turn in a prepaid receipt. Remember that. You cannot turn in a prepaid receipt. It's got to have markers on it. There's a, re oh, I guess we've got one being presented to us right there. And that idea is important. Why is it important? <laughs> you won't get paid. We want everybody to be very content to make as much money to get reimbursed everything when they're out there. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind that some of these things that we made you look at, made you go through, there's a purpose in it. Some of it is just so that you understand the ideas. What, what the heck is this all about? What, when we get there, what are, what are we going to be exposed to? Well, you can see it. You can see that, you know, sometimes you're right there at the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, you can see a lot of different things. And it's really important that you pay attention to this stuff. Those of you who have gone out there, you're not going to have that big of a learning curve. But new people should just follow suit with what we need to uh, we need to be explaining, directing you to. If you don't have a rider, make sure you communicate with me this week. We're going to see what we can do. Some of you obviously do. Uh, let me see here. Of the people that I'm seeing here, there's one, two, three, four. Looks like maybe five people are um are yeah. So that most everybody does have a rider. Chantel, do you have a rider? Thumbs up or thumbs down? I didn't see it. Was your thumb up or your thumb down? Yep. Good. Good for you. All right. Um, I guess without further ado, Mr. Roberson's going to take care of the meeting. And I'm, listen, I've got a margarita waiting for me, so I'm going to go back to the beach. That's it for me. Bye bye. Wait a minute. You got us here at eight o'clock at night and you got margaritas waiting for you? Yeah, <laughs> some of us know how to live. I'm sorry. 
I finished dinner and had to make a coffee just to uh, stay pumped up for you guys. Um, thanks, Mike. So I, I, I've met some of you guys before and, and some of us haven't met before. Um, Timothy's iPhone, I, I think we've met before. I see that in the chat. Um, I, I can't see you though. So there's a lot of Tims out there. I, I don't know which Tim you are. Um, the chat window is open. If y'all have questions as I'm going through this, just type them in there. Um, or if you just want to unmute yourself temporarily and, and stop me in the middle, that's perfectly okay. Just to ask away and, and we'll cover whatever it is. Um, I like to do the questions as we go along uh, for a couple of reasons. One, that's just, it, it keeps our train of thought on, on whatever it is. That way we don't forget the questions. Um, oh yeah, that Tim, the HVAC guy, okay. Hey, good to, good to hear you, Tim. Um, so we've got a couple things that we'll cover. Uh, one is just the um, standard operating procedures. So a lot of the things that Mike and I talk about, you know, where do these things come from? Uh, we're, we're told to do these things or that thing, and there's a legal document um, that tells us what we should and shouldn't be doing. And we're gonna go over that. And that is the... This one right here, the damage assessor scope of work. So the scope of work just tells us this is what you should be doing. You don't need to do this or that or the other, and you don't need to do the stuff out, outside. We we're I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, we're going down the road one day and and um, we're on a storm work. Dad and I are in the truck and we come across a tree that's across the road. Um, now, dad gets the chainsaw out and he starts cutting away. All we need is that tree wide enough to get the truck through and the generator that's behind us. We don't need to start clearing the, you know, pruning people's bushes over here and we don't need to chop the wood and we don't, it's common sense, but when you're in the middle of it, um, you just got to focus on the, on the scope of work. Uh, do the scope of work, do the full scope of work, but nothing more. Um, because when we start doing more, we start getting in trouble. Um, okay, so I'm not going to cover this. I'm not going to read this to you. This is available to you in your resources tab. Um, if you would like, I will do this. I will jump over. Everybody in here has already seen the resources tab, so I'm not going to, I won't waste your time doing that. Uh, this is in your resources tab. Uh, section one, um, we can kind of skip that. Section two, uh, RLI will meet with Duke Energy Oversight Representative prior to the work, blah, blah, blah. We don't need to spend time on that. Um, we do need to spend some time in here. In paragraph 222, uh, we've talked about PPE. I know it was in the last call. Let me pause. Um, is there anybody on this call who was not on the previous, either of the previous two calls? I can't see everybody's face, so maybe unmute and say something or use the chat box. I'm gonna assume that everybody was here, so we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on PPE, but we're gonna, I want you to see that this is an actual legal document that tells us we have to have the PPE, the personal protective equipment, hard hat, uh, gloves, personal voltage detector, which will be assigned to you or issued to you. Uh, once we're in the field, um, either by me or your team lead, uh, safety glasses, hard-toed shoes. I like hard-toed boots, but this is, you can use shoes, rain gear, traffic vest. Everybody knows the traffic vest, the yellow reflective vest. Uh, stick with yellow, not green or not red or not black, because those colors actually have meaning um, to the other um, to the other folks. Stick with yellow, uh, proper attire for the environment, warm weather, cold weather, that sort of thing. Okay, uh, two, four, paragraph two, four. Uh, we will be required to utilize Duke Energy's GPS tracking tool. Once we get to the yard, we install that tool on our phone. And once we get back home, we take that tool off of our phone. I don't think anybody wants to be tracked with a GPS once they're off the job, once they're at the house. I see some head shaking, um, and that's good. I, I wouldn't want that, but 
while we're on the job, um, it's certainly appropriate in this environment, in a storm environment, to to allow um, to allow us to, to allow ourselves to be tracked, right? Um, so expect that. Uh, paragraph two point five: Contractor required Duke Energy. Uh, so we're going to do timesheets. We know that. Uh, paragraph two six. Okay, here we start. Mike's mentioned meals and some receipts. This is where some of that comes in in 2.6. If, um, in general, once you leave the house until you get to the yard, uh, in general, you're allowed to have up to um, $30 in mill receipts, not to exceed $20 in a single receipt, right? But once you're on the yard and Duke is providing meals, naturally, if they're providing the meals, they expect you to eat there, right? They're not going to uh, provide the meal to you and also allow you to go out in town and, and buy a meal and reimburse you. They, they won't do that. If they're providing the meals, they want you to eat there, and that's just part of it, right? Um, on the way home, you're generally allowed um, – no, I'm not going to say that because I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I was going to say, on the way home, you're allowed a receipt, uh, but that may not be true. You may be paid in advance for a mill home, so scratch that part of what I said. Okie doke. Um, all right, checking the chat box. Nothing there. We're good. Okay, 2.7. Cover that. Um, if, for some reason, you can't get back to the yard to eat, uh, you're stuck in the middle of uh, two portions of the roads that have flooded. You, you can't go this way, you can't go that way, you're stuck. Uh, but across the street, there's a McDonald's. I, I'd imagine you can get pre-approval to get a meal from, from that McDonald's if they're open or, or whatever, wherever it is. Um, but if Duke is providing food, they expect you to eat there. Um, so if you feel like there's a extenuating circumstance where you got to get a mill, uh, get approval first, if you want it reimbursed. Um, do, 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 do. I'm on 2.9, RLI crews receiving mill stipends, 210, RLI fuel receipts. Mike talked about fuel receipts. Um, if we've got time, I'll, I'll go through my bonus material that we didn't get to in the, in the first video, um, but I do wanna go over the receipt in more detail. Hopefully you can see this. Um, I put my QCC number on it and the job. The job on this case was ATT uh, BAU. So the receipt needs certain things. It needs a date. It needs an address where you got the fuel. It needs the gallons. It needs the price per gallon the total fuel and the total sale. Every fuel receipt I've ever gotten from the pump, when I pay with a, with a card and it spits out the receipt, every receipt I've gotten has had all this stuff. We get in trouble when we have to go inside to get the receipt, because that, that's um, one of a couple of things, either it's a prepaid receipts, won't, will not get reimbursed, um, or they've got some weird format, uh, but every, every receipt that comes out of the machine has these things. Um, a quick bonus material on the back. What I do is I make these three little boxes where I submitted it, it was approved, and it was paid. That way I, I know that uh, I, the money's coming back to me. We're on the hook for the for, for the money out of out of uh, for the initial money. You know, we've got to get the, the fuel to get up to the job site until it's reimbursed. So we definitely want to keep those receipts in good order and get paid. Okay. What Checking if the the machine, I got a question. What if the machine doesn't spit out a receipt? It, that does happen. Um, if the machine doesn't spit out a receipt, we go inside and ask for a printed receipt. If for some reason that receipt is down, also um, ask for a handwritten receipt and take a picture of the pump, uh, take a picture of the card you used, document everything you can, get phone numbers, addresses, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Um, I have seen those approved before, the handwritten receipts like that, um, but you got to have some backup documentation. Uh, normally what they do 
is, is not accept the handwritten receipt. Normally what they do is ask you to call the uh, gas station at a day later, two days later, whatever time it works out and have them email, um, email the receipt to you. And they've got, those gas stations have ways to pull that information. If you can give them the, the time, the date, the time, the pump number, number of gallons, they can pull that information. Great question. Excuse me for one minute. Um, everything is supposed to be cash register generated or pump generated, which means if you turn in a handwritten receipt, you're probably going to get stymied. What Troy was telling you about, you know, usually can be done. It's not immediate, and sometimes that's a problem, but you, you just have to go by their deal. Um, you have to get what needs to be. I'm not going to tell you what other possibilities exist, but there's a lot of other ways that you can get a, a, a receipt. So just keep that in mind um, that handwritten receipts are a no-no. You can maybe make it work, but do your best to get a receipt generated from a pump or a cash register, always. Okay, sorry. Yep, I, I agree with what Mike's saying. I would only do the handwritten if you if there's just there's just no way to get a printed one. But yep. Um, section three: Duke Energy General Practices. Uh, right. These next paragraphs are on lodging. Um, generally, uh, Duke will put us in sleeper trailers. Uh, if y'all have been on storms, you've probably seen the RLI sleeper trailers. Uh, they're actually air conditioned, eight inch matches, uh, matches, goodness, mattresses. Um, they're actually fairly nice sleeper trailers. Um, and those could be on the yard. They could put us in a hotel room. We don't, we don't know. Each storm in each yard is going to be different. Um, but the takeaway here is, uh, it's, it's really Duke's, uh, responsibility to put us up in a hotel or, or some sleeping arrangements for a sleeper trailer or whatnot. Um, but this is storm work. It may not always happen. I've slept in my truck before, and that's just part of the part of the part of the job. Um, eventually, sleeping arrangements do come around. Um, so we'll take a point here. And um, when do you come on the clock? According to this, the uh, scope of work. When you leave your sleeping arrangements, so if it's a sleeper trailer, you're on the yard. When you leave that sleeper trailer, um, you're on the clock. If you leave your hotel and that hotel is 10 minutes down the road, well, when you leave that hotel, you're on the clock. Uh, so if we show up at, if show up time is 06 um, and the hotel is 10 minutes down the road, um, you, you know, maybe you're on the clock at 6.50. If they don't like the 6.50, then then maybe it's it's six o'clock and you know ten minutes isn't going to make a big deal, um, and then you come off the clock when you return back to those sleeping arrangements. Okay, so if we're told to be on standby, right, and that happens from time to time, so they put you in a sleeper trailer and we we uh, the storm is just too crazy outside. They don't want us out in the storm stay on standby, uh, just, just be available. The maximum number of hours we can get is, if I can read lips, I think I read 12. Wow. Yes, thank you, Doug, you're right. <laughs> um, I have a question on the back receipt, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. What you Go have ahead. to on the back of the storm and what have you and what yard you're in. Don't you write them on the back of the gas tickets? Uh, on the on the gas tickets, you write it on the front. Okay, but you write you write the storm and the yard you're in. Yep. Okay. So in this case, I put my QCC number and and I put in this case the storm was BAU. So they're gotcha. I guess I can start with you. Thank you. Yep. So that in that case, there really wasn't a yard. But yes, the yard would be good. Um. Okay. So hours. We talked about the standby hours. The maximum we can do on standby is 12. The maximum hours, working hours in a day is? 16. 
16, very good, Doug. Um, right. So that is, we should be able to get all of our work done for that day in 16 hours. If for some reason we can't, we've got to let Duke know, you got to let your team lead know uh, two to three hours in advance. So planning uh, can be made to, to accommodate, it's not really overtime, uh, but accommodate over 16 hours. Um, I probably shouldn't have even used that word overtime because we don't get overtime pay, we just, whatever the straight pay is. Um, okay. Okay, check in the chat box. We're good there. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so these are going to be some expectations and uh, backgrounds. And that big bold thing on the front basically says, this is an ideal world, what we want. But in a storm situation, sometimes these rules are relaxed. Uh, if we go down to paragraph two, a little more than halfway down, damage assessor. Um, a lot, we've covered a lot of this in the other phone calls, in the training, in the test. So I'm just going to hit the highlights here and either hit me in the chat box or, or unmute yourself and say something. Um, if you got a question here, damage assessor should be able to identify primary and secondary electrical facilities, including poles, primary wires, secondary wires, services, primary insulators, transformers, fuses, reclosures, substations, et cetera. They need to demonstrate proficiency and distinguishing between energized versus de-energized lines and open or tripped versus closed and protected devices. They also need to be able to identify the difference between electrical cable vision and telephone lines. Damage assessors are responsible for surveying damage, determining which protective devices, devices available, isolate the identified damage, and for developing a restoration plan for a designated area or circuit. And we got some other uh, duties in there. Um, uh, I see a question on pay, Mike. Um, so, uh, Octavius, Mike will address the pay. At some point. Um, okay. Um, safety, safety, safety is that first bullet point there. Um, nobody wants to go out to these storms and get hurt. And I don't want anybody to go out there and get hurt. We don't need to take unnecessary risk. Just going out there away from our normal environment carries its own risk. Um, so just be smart out there. Okay, doke. Okay. Um, minimum qualifications. Like I said, some of these may be relaxed. Um, the key to take away on this page, I just went up a page, job classification descriptions, and this next page, three and four, there's the three main jobs that we need to know about. And this is where you guys can help the whole team out. I think most everybody on the phone call is uh, going for the damage assessor role. Um, the other jobs are wire guard. Um, so if you know somebody, hey, maybe they don't know the difference between a primary line and a secondary and a transformer and how to read the transformer. And, um, but maybe you know somebody who's smart enough not to touch electrical wires when they're down on the ground. That might yeah, be a, a good wire guard candidate. Uh, the wire guard is once we identify live wires on the ground, um, we can call it in. Uh, hey, Troy, I got live wires on the ground. What's my next step? Okay, your next step is uh, stay there, watch those live lines, don't let anybody near them, set out your cones if you got cones, um, and wait until the wire guard gets there. Okay, we're on it. Wire guard shows up, uh, you might give them a little pass down. Hey, the little sensor on my hat went off on these lines. Uh, so they're live, their job is to guard those, those lines, don't let anybody near them. And then the damage assessor and their rider or their driver can go and uh, do the rest of their pod. Um, so we got damage assessor, we got wire guards, and we got the driver. So the driver does not necessarily need to be a damage assessor um, or a wire guard. Uh, but in my mind, <clears throat> if they're riding with the damage assessor, that's a great opportunity to train uh, that driver. 
uh, maybe not the first day, because first day you're still figuring things out. But as you go along, uh, you can train that driver um, on, on the things that you're doing, and we can help grow the team that way. Uh, okay. Questions there? Yeah, um, while we're doing the damage assessment job, um, are we available to do other jobs, pulling generators, or are we just doing damage assessment or what? Once we're on the damage assessment team, we're, we're on that team for that storm. Um, so I, I can't think of a situation where we would be damage assessor one day and then pulling generators the next day and then back as damage assessors another day. That, that's just probably not going to happen. Uh, there might be a situation where um, the storm comes in, and we'll talk about one that's in the Atlantic now. A storm comes in, it does its damage, we're assigned a damage assessor role, we go out, we do the work, um, and that work is sort of closed down, it's done, it's finished, and as that's finished, another storm comes in. Uh, it's possible in that scenario, I can imagine anyway, that um, that the, the role could change going from damage assessor to something else, but in the middle of a storm, um, it, it's highly unlikely. That answer your question. Just, yeah. Hey, um, Rodney. So I, here's what I think everybody should be prepared for. Okay, so there's a storm, um, knocks the heck out of an area, and they need 25 or 30, 50 assessors. But guess what? We only get 10 to 10 teams to fit in, and maybe we've got 20 available or 30 available. So what does that mean? Does that mean you guys don't go to work? Well, that's why hopefully you've all chose some other idea. And Rodney's talking about deploying generators, which he certainly could do. Henry could do that. Doug could do that. Tim could do that. Um, so I guess the point is uh, Eric Fox could do that. There's, um, there's many different hats you could wear out there. And damage assessors, that's what you're being groomed for. That's the idea. However, that may not be the job type that is available to work right then and there. So um, I would say if you have other possibilities, mechanical, whatever it might be, yes, we'll fit you in as best we can. Of course, you do understand this is all semi-volunteer. If we call you, and you're not available, that's fine. If we call you and it, you just don't particularly like working in North Carolina or Texas, okay, yeah, I get that. So you can just ask out. Um, I think where where I would where I would say, be prepared, be flexible. Then your choices are going to be greater than. Okay. Enough said. Okay. Um, Mike, did you see the pay question from Octavius? I don't, it's not important to me whether you answer it here or whether you call Octavius. I just want to make sure. Uh, I'll get it. I'll get a hold of Octavius. I'll talk to him okay. separate. Okay. Um, okay. We've all seen the training, uh, but I believe in repetition. And I think that helps us, especially since we're not all in person and we're not all looking at the same telephone pole outside somewhere so we'll look at a picture because <laughs> that's what we got um, on the top um, we can tell that this is a three phase uh, line coming in uh, three primary conductors and because we've got the one the two and then the three lines coming across with the insulators um, keeping the, the electricity off of the uh, wooden telephone pole and then I don't know if you can see it but right there there is a few it's just not labeled, um, and that fuse is closed. There's a little arm that's closed right there. It's, that little arm is up. If that fuse were blown, that little arm would be dangling down below it. Um, and that line coming off the fuse comes down here to the transformer, and that transformer converts a higher voltage to a lower voltage on these secondary lines. You can see the leads coming off. There's one, and there's two, and there's three. Um, you got the... the two secondary lines and the neutral. Um, 
And then down here are the utilities. We're not going to do a lot with the utilities, um, just other than just mentally identifying them. Um, I guess you could put it on your service order if you wanted to. Um, so good there. We should have all seen this before. Check in the chat box. Yep. All right. And then I'm going to jump down here to the last part of this power. Okay. There's just another more of a drawing picture. Again, the primary wires with insulators one, two, three. So you got A, B, and C. Um, then you got a line coming down off of uh, C and it's going into the fuse. And this little arm right here is, is parallel to the insulator here. Um, and so that means the fuse is closed or it's, it's normal. Um, and it would, it would have a break right here if it was open. And that little arm would just dangle straight down. I don't know, it might be kicked over a little bit, but it's, it would be dangling. Um, and you got your line coming into the transformer. And then you have your, your neutral is usually right below the transformer. Um, and then your, your uh, secondary line. Oop. Off the secondary line, um, the service drop is, is gonna be a little bit easier to see if you're out in the field because it'll be connected to the house. That's the, the line that comes from the pole to the house. And it's usually wrapped uh, the triplex, the, the two hot lines and the neutral um, are wrapped up together and they go in one, one thick bundle. And then down here are the uh, utilities. Good there? Troy, uh, I have a question. How do you know which direction the power is coming from, the left or the right, or is there a direction? It's service from some area. Do you know that? Right. It, yeah, it's, it's, um, it may not be coming from just the left or the right, it just may be present. Um, yeah, these, the way the grid works, it, it may not be coming from the left. Now, if you're on a street um, and you're coming into the subdivision and you can see the larger telephone poles go down the smaller telephone poles and you get to the end of the street, well, you, you know which way it's coming from then. Gotcha. Uh, but you, you may not know where it's coming from. So I, I think you're asking, um, if I know that this line is down, well, two or three spans up, um, is it going to be live or is, it, is the power going to be down? <laughs> we don't know. We're going to rely on that, that little uh, device we wear in our hats to be sounding alarms. And uh, we're going to use a little bit of ingenuity that we've got. You know, we can listen for generators. We can look for lights in the houses and that sort of thing. Is that kind of where that question was going? I think I think that answers. I'm just curious. Sometimes you know, you're what end of the hotline are you on? If it's coming from the east or the west, and but I, I get your point. Okay. Yes, sir. This page right here. Um, this page is important enough to me that I think we all have it printed off, and it's in it's in some some book. It's in some notebook. It's in some. I've a. Uh, you know, I've even got a notebook here with, you know, this is where I keep mine and my notebook. And right, right behind this page is the, um, is the glossary. And I, I don't expect to be able to read those, but y'all have seen those pages before. And this is the glossary right here, the next page. Right. Um, okay. We're good there. Okay. So, Time on deck is 8.35. Uh, Mike, is there anything else specific you wanted me to cover or can I cover some bonus material? Um, I'm just going to mention something. I don't know that I heard you say it. You might have. Um, they do recommend you have uh, ocular or binocular so that you can read whatever's on a pole or if it's a tangled mess and you don't, you don't, there's no way you should be going in there to try and dig things out. But that's one thing that maybe you should have. Or if you have one of the new, a little bit more improved phones, you can snap a picture and then blow it up 
within the phone and you might be able to get the information you need. Just some thoughts. Um, you're not always able to see everything directly, so you may have to use some other device. That was my one thought. And I don't know, you know, everybody here, I think, has a pretty good sense of themselves. I know Octavius is new, but everybody else has a pretty good sense of themselves. I don't think anybody here, they may have questions, but I think everything that you laid out for them, they pretty much understand. So um, whatever direction you want to go in, and if anybody wants them, you know, if anybody raises their hand or unmutes themselves and says, hey, can you just go over this one aspect? Yeah, I'm all good with that. So do whatever you need to do. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is uh, bonus material. This is the notebook that I keep. And I'm going to share with you guys kind of what I put in here when I'm on a storm. The, the, let's see, I think this is the last storm I was on. It was in May. May, uh, uh, yep, May of this year. Um, so the first thing I put is the date, the time, and I'm activated by, in this case, it was Lindsay Clark. Um, so when I'm activated, whether it's by phone or by text, I, I make a note of it. Um, that way, you know, two days down the road and, you know, 40 hours of work later, uh, I don't forget this stuff. That's the whole purpose of this logbook, if you will. Um, I put the address of where they tell me to go and I put the starting mileage on my truck. Um, I can't tell you that you'll be able to write the mileage off um, as a deduction, but keep track of the mileage, write it down and turn that into your tax person. Um, let's see here. I've got the address. I know y'all can't see this, but I'm reading through it here. Um, in this case, this was a generator deployment. So they gave me the uh, job codes, the location, the serial number, all that sort of stuff where I'm going. I write down the time that I actually arrive at the yard. So I've got a record of my travel time. A lot of times I'll even put in here if I stop for fuel, what time I stop for fuel. Um, Arrive at the yard, do, 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 do. I leave the yard. Um, I had a generator fuel stop. I put the time that I arrived at the site uh, with the generator. Um, in this particular case, I could not close that work order on my phone. Uh, as it relates to us here on this damage assessor, we are going to be doing our, our uh, assessments on the phone through the, through the damage assessor uh, Duke app. Um, in this particular case, I was not able to do it for AT&T, so I had to call into the uh, bridge and and get them to close it out. There's a, a particular situation that I had to do that. Um, all right, date and time that I left the site and then arrived at the yard. I, basically, what I'm communicating to you is I'm keeping track of, of any change in my day. So if I leave a yard, if I arrive at a yard, as it relates to us, if when we first arrive to the yard, when we arrive, um, we get our orders and we arrive at the pod and we're going through and we leave our pod, we complete our pod uh, and we arrive back at the yard. I'm keeping track of of all those things because you're you're. Has anybody worked a long day before? <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, you know, if you do that once, you can you might be able to keep up with it in your mind. But once you start day two, three, four, you, your memory starts to kind of fade and uh, write it down is all I'm saying. Um, okay. And when I get home, I write down when I get home and I write down the ending mileage. That way I've got a record of my total mileage. I keep all my receipts and I just file them away. You know, maybe I'll never need them. Maybe I will. I don't know. But it's inexpensive to, to just file them away and keep notes like that. Um, that's kind of the bonus material. All right, I've got a couple fun pictures. And let me pull these up. How many this of one, have you worked uh, as a damage assessor? Uh, I, I've not done many as a damage assessor, uh, but I've been doing storms since 2016. Uh, Dorian, Hurricane Dorian was my first one. Has anybody damage in the group done any of the uh, damage assessment work? Yes. Who has? I know Ron's done, I think Ron's done more than me. Um, 
Ron's not on this call. Mike. Eric, Mike Eric Fox. Fox. Yeah, Eric Mike. Fox. Okay. Yeah, I, I've done once. Yeah. Can you hear me, Mike? Uh, we, all heard, we all heard you. Okay. We all heard you. At least I heard you. I, I'm, I'm trying to work this computer. I'm a little, a little bit slow. No, you're doing fine. You're doing okay. just fine. So what was the question for Eric Fox, if there was a question? Maybe there's not. Yeah, we actually, we've only had, I think, uh, six crews out. Because um, this, this is a relatively new program for us. We're excited about it because we see a great opportunity, not just for this company, but for the people that are going to be doing it. I, I will say that we want to spend as much time and effort and money in creating, you know, a, not, a good group of people if we didn't think that it was a smart move. And we thought it was. And I think everybody will, uh, everybody that goes out once will want to do this again. All right, I'm done. Go ahead. Hey, Mike, take it away. where was uh, the damage assessor's uh, job? Where was that at? What storm? Um, I don't know exactly. It was in Tennessee, which seems kind of weird, but it was in Tennessee last year. Um, Eric, Eric, you know, you probably know. Where was that storm? Yeah, it was, it was way up north up there. I'm not exactly sure. It was uh, north of North Carolina or something, I guess. It was up in that Tennessee area. Yeah, yeah. Did that answer your question? Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Fox. Mm -hmm. You all see this? You all see this picture of the runway? Can you all see the picture of the runway there? Yes. Yes, we see it. Go ahead. Okay, good. This is um, uh, this happened to be captured by Google Maps. You can see down there. But this was at the Havana Airport, uh, just near Tallahassee. I think it was Hurricane Michael that we were doing this. Um, this was a yard that uh, Robin Corkins and I were working. Um, and you can kind of see the runway right here. They closed the runway down so that we could park the trucks here. Now, this is in the middle of the day. Um, but what happens in the, in the evening, all these trucks would fill up this yard. I mean, this yard was slapped full of trucks. And then in the morning, they all... Uh, they all go out. Um, so the work that we are doing is give information on how many, uh, how much of this equipment and that sort of thing. Yep, we had a helicopter pad there. Um, and how much of this equipment and supplies need to be deployed to the area. Um, so as the, as the uh, lieutenant would say, if you will, um, if you're going to fight a battle, you, you fight it with strategy. The general would say, if you're going to fight a battle, you fight it with logistics. And so we're helping Duke Energy uh, get these get these uh, lines up and the power restored with the, with the logistics. That's our our main role. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, yeah, we see we see images, but it didn't. You're not. Yeah, uh, it just you just showed us the thumbnails. You didn't show us the big picture, which is pretty impressive. Oh no! Very impressive. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. I do have some. I do have some pictures of some of the yards, and I don't think they had a thousand trucks. Well, I know there were a thousand linemen or, or fifteen hundred linemen, but they had uh, just bucket truck after bucket truck, and you know the different uh, heavy duty trucks along with a lot of pickups. So it is pretty impressive when you see all that stuff. But if you can't share the screen, you just have to take our word for it. Um, it's it's a small army that they have that they assemble. And here's something that I've always thought, and I've always expressed this to everybody that's ever worked a storm or wanted to work a storm. Pretty incredible. You bring together this group of humanity. Now the linemen, you understand that part. They've been trained to do this work, and and the different people that work for Duke or ATT, but you bring together a whole group of individuals that haven't necessarily done this work before. They don't, they don't, you know, they're not full-time um, hell tent installers or they're not full-time cooks or whatever it might be, 
they get on these yards and they work like the devil and pretty darn successful at the end of the tour, at the end of the deployment, it's successful. Very incredible what human beings are capable of. And you are, you're taken to the task. You're out there and the information's coming to you at a fire hose, you know, what you have to do. And six different people are telling you what to do all at once. And you have to figure out what the best method is to operate sometimes. A little bit freaky, a little bit scary, but it works. Okay, yeah, I, I see that, that same image up on the screen, but it's not of the Havana airport. It's of all of the above. Yes. Uh, I can go on. I, I can tell you more about this whole concept, not just damage assessment, but everything that goes on. And um, it, it, uh, it tests you. It, it's not, uh, it's not, easy peasy it's not an easy go but um most people that get out there and do the job yeah they want to go back because it is a little bit of an adrenaline rush when they get home they go phew man that was some run when do we do this again and you think i'm kidding i'm not i have people call all during the year saying hey is we're going to have some more storm work of course they're thinking two different things they're thinking you know i want to get back out there again and also when am i going to get that big fat paycheck again and you know good point on both uh both ideas are you having any success there or is that not going to happen for you i that, it's as big as I can make it on my screen. I don't know what else to do. Well, that for some reason, Air that was Havana Airport, not in Havana, Cuba, in Havana, Havana Florida. <laughs> no, not in Cuba. All right. Well, anybody else have anything that they want to express? Got um, Somebody's just coming in now. Jeez! Oh, you guys wow. know what Bates Duke does the power thing? I know it's Florida and Texas and Louisiana and the Carolines. Is that it? It for for Duke Energy, yes. But there's, um, I think there'll be work for FPNL, which is mostly in florida but not exactly because that's a it's a bigger company than that so fpnl and entergy so if you look at the coverage maps for those three entities that may give you an idea as to where we could go but at any given point in time it could be um you know it could be in a different direction that's all i'll say we we don't have uh well you know the deal Hurricane can hit anywhere, anytime, any place. We're at the mercy of when that happens, where we're going to go. And assessment would have to be for somebody that RLI is contracted with. And if it hit, I, I believe uh, this is probably true. If it hit in some areas and handle going west, there are some areas there that we, we might not have work for. That's why I said it's always good that... Um, you have a backup plan, maybe installing generators. You know, you, know, you certainly could do that, Doug. You've, you've been there, you've done that. Henry's done that. Um, Eric has done that. So, yep, always have a backup plan. Um, Mr. Roberson? I'm good. You ha you're good. Anybody else have anything that they'd like to uh, express? Um, we're not having the hands-on meeting anymore in person where, um, like we did the last couple of years. No, we no, they'll, they'll be there. They've canceled out all of those things for, you know, COVID reasons, but they, they didn't do that. We were planning on doing that. And I don't know if you, if you're aware of this, Rodney, but, um, we were going to do it and they moved the yard from Sumterville, I think it's Evans Hill, 
they didn't move it very far, but as we were scheduling everything, they moved the yard and that took them like two weeks or whatever. So kind of put a crimp in our style. Uh, Ron was going to do that, but we couldn't do it. So I don't think we will have an opportunity to do that. And I know that that does mean something to everybody. It does give you a little bit more warm and fuzzy about the job, but that's why uh, these Zoom meetings are supposed to give you a little bit of that feel. And no, it's not the same, but when you're out there, you're not without resources. And the resources would be call somebody, call Troy, call Ron, call Mike. Um, we all understand enough about it that can help you if you come into something that you just feel like, holy crap, what am I supposed to do here? There's also the idea that you may, you may get um, help from Duke or FPNL or Entergy. They may tell you something, you know, that's where we may have to steer you. And they may say, get the hell out of there. No, they won't say that. They'll just say something like, you know, that's not the area that you need to be concerned with. Move around that and we'll figure out what to do. Okay. All right. Yep. Is there any storm activity out there now that you know of stirring up? Well, what do you think? <laughs> you, sh you should be, you should, everybody should be going to some service, freebies, NOAA, N-O-A-A. -A. There is a little bit of activity that is headed towards Puerto Rico and Cuba, and it may indeed impact continental U.S. If you're going to ask me about my prediction, I will tell you whatever I say, do just the opposite, okay? <laughs> I've, not, I've not been very good at predicting landfall for storms. I oftentimes predict the ferocity of them, but not necessarily where they're going to hit. You know, um, you know, Doug, that Florida has been very, very lucky. We have avoided many storms and if one of those big bad boys comes right down Main Street, Florida, there'll be work here, I would guess, six months. It, it hasn't happened, and I'm not hoping it happens, but I'm just saying, if we had one of those Cat 4, Cat 5s come right up through Miami and just rip, snort away, it could be devastating. Um, what happened in Louisiana pretty bad. I mean, they, they had one, two, three of them, you know, that one stage there. And that, that left a lot of work to be done. Remember, assessors work, not really before, but after the storm hits, and then, you know, it goes on for a while, for a while. And then there's the forensic work, too, that you have to do that involves going back, checking the work, doing a lot of the things that are preventative. And, um, yeah, if something like that happens, I, I would say first thing I'm doing is flying up to New York. <laughs> but but um, assessing everything is going to be just a very, very large task that could go on for who knows, you know. Um, also, the other work, you know, the generator deployments, the feeding the linemen, taking care of the yards. Now, nobody realizes how involved this is. With Sandy, there were 15,000 people outside of the linemen, 15,000 people that were working, supplying food. And I don't think at that point, I don't think we did uh, sleeper trailers or laundry. Now, if something like that happened, I don't know that we'd have enough people to fit the bill. Again, how, how something of that nature could unfold We've never seen. We've seen little bits and pieces of it, but we've never seen it. So I would say um, this year may or may not be it, but we better be prepared. And that's why they reached out to us and they said, get as many damage assessors as you can. When I said, do you mean 50? They said, no, more. That's their, that's their thoughts. I'm not saying they're right 
or they're wrong or this isn't the year or is the year, but they know that if something of that kind of magnitude hits, it will be a very long haul and they'll need as many people as they possibly can put together. And what we're doing now is getting everybody ready. And Rodney coined it best, you know, hey, it'd be good if we had one of those meetings where everybody could kind of see it and understand it. But I think uh, we've got a couple of good people that have talked about it. And some of these guys have worked it, have done it. That gives me a feeling of at least a, a lot more confidence that you've got people out there that you can refer to. And Eric Fox is a certified electrician. Um, um, gosh, <laughs> I, I drew a blank. Uh, Ron Customer, he knows a lot about these, all these ideas. Um, Troy certainly understands all of these concepts. Maybe he may not have been out an assessment crew, but he understands all this stuff. So there's, uh, you've got a wealth of knowledge that you can rely on. And, you know, the last resource, you know, the guy at the other end of the horse, that'd be me. You can always call me and chances are we can figure out what we need to do. I'm, I'm not the answer man, but oftentimes I have resources. We can find out the right answers for you. Have I been going on and on and on? <laughs> Somebody stop me. Yeah, I, I think we've, we've got the idea of what these what this agenda is all about. And I do wish, I do wish that everybody does what they need to do to be prepared. And I think most of you all have, so I don't have a problem with that, but there's other people that just need to watch those videos and get a good understanding. They should be in these meetings too. Um, what what I, I, I learned some, you know, I, I'm not a sponge, but I learned something almost every time from somebody that talks about certain circumstances that they've come upon and they figured out what to do. So, okay, I'll shut up. Anybody have anything else? I guess that's it for you, huh? All right, you, you can, uh, everybody sign off. And if you need me, you can call me afterwards. I'll call Octavius. Um, but thank you very much for attending. Have a good night.